everyone. Welcome to this episode of Postmodern. This episode will be about the relationship between postmodernism and literature. Today, my guest is David Mailer. Dave served on the Veritas Board of Governors from 1998 to 2008. He and his wife Sally, the director of Veritas's award-winning concert choir, owned and operated the Coffee Cottage in Newburgh for 21 years. He is the editor of the literary journal Triggerfish Critical Review. His chapbook, God Truck Nature, appeared in the chapbook anthology Burning Gorgeous, Seven 21st Century Poets. He began serving on the board of the Oregon Poetry Association in the fall of 2019. His full-length collection of poetry, Roadworthy, was published by Abade Publishing in late 2020. He is currently at work finalizing a manuscript of prose poems entitled The Holiness of Landfills. Now, on to the interview. Hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, this My name is Tristan Rickard, and I am here with Dave Mailer. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for inviting me on, Tristan. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an honor. Yeah, uh, it's an honor to have you here, too. Uh, so I believe you wanted to start us off with a couple of poems, so one at the beginning and one at the end, so... Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So this is a poem. I just thought it would be fun to open with uh, this poem by um, Zbigniew Herbert. And uh, he's a, he was a Polish poet that lived under the Nazis in Poland. And then also the tyrannical, you know, or totalitarian communist regime. He was a writer who uh, stopped publishing for quite a while. And then he, uh, and then he started got out of Poland and started publishing finally when things lightened up. Anyway, this is called um, What Mr. Cogito Thinks of Hell, The Lowest Circle of Hell. Contrary to popular opinion, it is not populated by despots, matricides, or those who lust after the flesh of others. It is a retreat for artists full of mirrors, instruments, and paintings. At first glance, it is the most comfortable, infernal department, free of tar, fire, and physical torture. All year round competitions, festivals, and concerts are held. There is no peak season. The peak is permanent and virtually absolute. Every two or three months, new movements are formed and nothing, it seems, will halt the triumphant march of the avant-garde. Beelzebub is a lover of the arts. He boasts that his choirs, poets, and painters almost outdo those in heaven. Where there's better art, there's better government. That much is clear. Shortly, they will be able to measure their strength at the festival of two worlds. And then we'll see what remains of Dante, Fra Angelico, and Bach. Beelzebub supports the arts. He guarantees his artists tranquility, a healthy diet, and complete isolation from infernal life. So, uh, that's Zbigniew Herbert. Um, I just wanted to kind of qualify, Tristan, before we really get started, I want to qualify my qualifications for talking about postmodernism in literature. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm a poet and a practitioner, um, and I don't have the laser focus of the academic specializing in cultural, literary, critical theory. Um, you know, my, the critics that I really like are, um, well, you know, early on when I was trying to write fiction was John Gardner and Flannery O'Connor. Um, you know, I read Flannery O'Connor's Habit of Being, Mystery of Manners, and John Gardner's On Moral Fiction and Art of Fiction, and I really enjoy Randall Jarrell, Stephen Dobbins, Dana Joya, Christian Wyman. Um, so that's kind of, I'm, you know, I, I wouldn't be one to explain the theories of Roland Barthes and Jacques Derrida or Foucault, um, but still, you know, they're they've influenced us so I'll do my best all right thank you um, so my first question and it's of course very very simple uh, <laughs> what is postmodernism well um, yes that is a very complicated thing to explain <laughs> um, I think uh, I think basically you know we, we don't exist in a vacuum um, Postmodernists probably, to some degree, act as though we do. But, but basically, in order to understand postmodernism, you really have to, you have you have to understand 
what postmodernism was reacting to, which is modernism. And then, you know, of course, modernism was reacting to um, romanticism, and it goes all the way back to the Enlightenment, and then before that, you know, medieval Catholicism. And so, but at, at any rate, let's, I would probably want to just quickly go through modernism, um, which was, you know, there was a belief in objective truth and reality, um, no belief in God, but in rationality, uh, um, the natural sciences, technology, this was considered advancement. There was belief in human progress. Um, the, the really big factors were industrialization, individualism, experimentation and innovation, um, the birth of psychology, alienation from others in nature, and uh, World War One and the Depression and World War II. Um, these were the huge things. A lot of things that we continue to do in literature uh, in modernism is, you know, like, say, surrealism, um, prose poetry, you know, free verse or verse libre, you know, in the 20s. T.S. Eliot was talking about that. Um, things like stream of consciousness, uh, Virginia Woolf and James Joyce, you know, obviously in America, in poetry, there was Wallace Stevens and Eliot and William Carlos Williams um, and Ezra Pound. Uh, in fiction, it was Hemingway, Faulkner, uh, Steinbeck, you know, I'm thinking of the Nobel Prize winners here. Um, you know, that was modernism. And so uh, there was also, you know, a lot of absurdity. I mean, just the because of the wars and the, the carnage. Um, so these were the big things in, in um, modernism. In uh, postmodernism, I would say, you know, a bunch of other things come to the fore. And, and basically, it kind of splits up. There was there were things happening in the 50s and 60s, and then things that are happening now. And so I'm just going to kind of maybe go through a chain of what we started with and where we ended up. And um, the first reaction, uh, well, let me just kind of outline postmodernism. Just I'll just throw a bunch of stuff at you. Um, the biggie is, um, let's see, pastiche, um, taking the ideas and styles of previous eras or writings, pasting them together, narratives, inviting or relying on reader involvement, hybridization, um, minimalism and maximalism, incorporation of pop culture, confusion of what's real with what's unreal, blurring the boundaries, you know, magical realism is, is another factor, um, blurring facts with fiction, novels that are memoirs, memoirs that are unwittingly fiction, um, journalism and personal essay that read like fiction, you know, odd juxtaposition, performance art, art installations, slam poetry, um, the emphasis on meaning, more emphasis on words and language, a, a big, well, I don't know how big it was, but a, one movement in poetry was language poetry, which focuses so much on the language that meaning is, is just irrelevant, pretty much. Um, fragmentation, reality is socially constructed, that's a really biggie. That's a that's a you know multiculturalism. So those are some of the things that you know, and also just skating along the surface. Um, so that that's generally what was going on. Specifically, you know, to begin with, I think the biggest reaction to modernism was the Beats in the '60s. Um, and so you know, we kind of have to start with the Beats. And well, actually, maybe before I do that, you know, th there was this thing called New Criticism. Um, which was a modernist thing that started in the UK, and it was, but it was it was strangely like um, the French deconstructionist post-structuralists, um, in that it it de-emphasized the author, but it, you know, and, and it was all about it. W it was actually elevating the text and wanting to get rid of the distraction of biography, um, and just you know looking at the artifact as a as a, you know, alone, which is also something that deconstruction does. Um, 
Um, in contrast to the new critics and how they treated the text as an exalted artifact, um, here's Stephen Moore talking about what deconstructionists do with a text. Um, in his recent book, he plots stages in recent criticism that can be labeled by such writers as Kermode, Fish, and ultimately Roland Barthes and Jacques Derrida. Um, the idea of this school, put absurdly, is that the only thing to do with a text is to play with it for, for oneself. I must see what it does to me and not ask whether there is another mind out there behind the text. And of course, if that is so, there is not much point discussing the text with someone else. There will be no right or wrong reading, only my reading and your reading. And, you know, obviously, to me, that sort of attitude just seems so narcissistic and onanistic and nonsensical um, to not allow the text to come from a source to... You know, later N.T. Wright says that, you know, he allows the text to subvert him. And, you know, which if believing the Gospels, that's how we view parables and other scriptures. So, you know, this this to me is is one of the real problems with postmodernism. So so but it was very, you know, it was invented by formalists. So it was like I.A. Richards and William Empson in, in the U.K. And then that was picked up by. A southern group called the Fugitives, Ran, you know, John Ransom, uh, Clint Brooks, Robert Penn Warren, you know, Alan Tate, and basically decontextualizing the artifact, you know, to try to get rid of distraction as a form of elevation, but but it was also problematic. And so, so anyway, it was just sort of this academic um, elitist way to view things. And uh, so the Beats were reacting to that, and they were really a, a breath of fresh air acting in response to the old guard that seemed stodgy, overly formal, and academic. Um, they were gritty, irreverent misfits and outsiders who interjected non-poetic language and subject matter, incorporated slang and popular culture, countercultural ideas. I mean, you know, you, maybe you would you would know these people like Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac, you know, they met in Columbia. Um, they might have been roommates. I can't really remember how they met, but they were, they were very close friends. And obviously, you know, Ginsberg's big manifesto was Howl. And he came out with a short little book with Howl in it. And, and it, you know, it was banned. Um, Kerouac, wrote on the road, you know, I, I really, you know, by the way, I just want to say that, you know, I admire these works. Um, you know, it was post-war countercultural writing, you know, it was rejecting the economic materialism, um, you know, the, it was replacing the lost generation who, you know, who were these writers after the wars, um, with a beat generation and and it really kind of livened up poetry and novels and um, it was the younger generation against the older generation at that point um, you know and revolutionary and and then there was Gary Snyder you know there were a bunch of others Gary Snyder wrote a poem called Milton by Firelight um, in which he makes the case that heaven and Satan, as narrated by Milton, have little to do with the camp in the Sierras. Um, no paradise, no fall, only the weathering land. And, you know, it means, you know, something like paradise lost means even less to a single jack miner or a chainsaw boy or a crew camping out building trails out in the western American wilderness. Um, he went off to Japan to study the language and, and Zen practice. Uh, there were others um, as well. Um, you know, just sort of Lawrence Ferlinghetti was a biggie. Uh, he started City Lights Books, and that was very influential as a gathering place. There, there were, you know, so this was something that was being carried on in Greenwich Village and the West Coast. Um, beat at first 
meant exhausted. And then I think Kerouac, due to his Catholic upbringing, kind of changed it to shorthand for beatitude. You know, he was a Catholic. I mean, he was brought up Catholic. I don't, I think, you know, there's, there's hope that he, at the end of his life, was coming back to Catholicism, but hard to say. Um, so that's, that's the beats. Um, I mean, you know, I'm kind of brushing the surface here, but, <laughs> but then the other thing that happened in the 60s that's really, really key was metafiction. And, you know, the, the deconstructionists in France, the, you know, these philosophers were, or these literary critics were going going on in the 50s and 60s, but I don't think metafiction necessarily was directly a result of what they were talking about because it was kind of coincidental. It might have, there may have, I, this is something I just don't know, but I do know that they're, they're both kind of on the same wavelength. And so what metafiction was, um, was writers writing about writing. Um, it was an exploration of the literary text um, um, it was, it was something that was, um, you know, something that Lawrence Stern and Tristram, Tristram Shandy, Shanty, uh, did. Henry Fielding did a bunch of this stuff in, um, especially Joseph Andrews, uh, Cervantes, you know, had Don Quixote find a, you know, text about himself and uh you know and was criticizing it because it wasn't accurate um you know stuff like actually even chaucer you know appearing in the canterbury tales where he starts to tell a tale and gets interrupted and you know so you know texts of their own nature and status as fiction um you know just sort of fiction that was exploring that uh it was playing around with conven conventions self-consciously and reflexively the author is present directly in the text and addressing the reader as a writer. Jokes, gags, um, rather than meaning or depth, usually it's sort of, uh, you know, joking around. Um, so, you know, the other thing that's important to say, I think, is that, you know, this metafictional stuff isn't really new. Um, it was... It was something that was, um, you know, something that Lawrence Stern and Tristram, Tristram Shandy, Shanty uh, did. Henry Fielding did a bunch of this stuff in, um, especially Joseph Andrews, uh, Cervantes, you know, had Don Quixote find a, you know, text about himself and, uh, you know, and was criticizing it because it wasn't accurate um you know stuff like actually even chaucer you know appearing in the canterbury tales where he starts to tell a tale and gets interrupted and and then shakespeare you know breaking the fourth wall with uh asides and um you know to the to the audience uh doing monologues you know having plays within plays so so this stuff's been around mm -hmm. i guess the difference was that the metafictionists in the 60s were, were doing it as satire, and mm -hmm. it was ironic. Um, it was, there was a belief in God in these previous writers that were using metafiction, and there was, there, but there was no belief in God in, in the metafictionists in the 60s. So, so who are they? Well, you know, some examples would be um, Robert Coover, John Barth, um, and I actually, you know, there, there's a couple stories that I, I actually really admire by those two. Um, also, you know, Thomas Pynchon, um, Don DeLillo, um, um, so yeah, let me give you an example of the sort of thing that, you know, like Coover wrote this famous story. Um, so both of these, both Barth and Coover wrote these stories in 1969. Coover wrote The Babysitter. Um, Barth wrote Lost in the Fun House. And, you know, um, basically the way The Babysitter works is, you know, it features a couple who goes to a party. They hire a babysitter to watch their son, daughter, and baby. Um, the narrative moves linearly 
toward a denouement, but consists of alternate alternative possible scenes and scenarios in paragraph sequences featuring different points of view amongst all the characters. So, you know, you much of the material involves fantasies of a, you know, or at least embarrassing, awkward si- situations. Um, some of it sexual, you know, most of it sexual, actually, you know, having to do with uh, all the different characters. Um, between the husband and wife, the babysitter, her boyfriend and his friend, you know, the children. Um, and, and so the overarching narrative is, is that, you know, we're going through the evening as this couple's gone to this party and then, and they're, you know, so there's an overarching thing, but then there's alternative possibilities within the text and presented. And, and you, you begin to not know which is which. And, and even the TV plays a role where, you know, whatever's on the TV at the moment, which is at one point a Western, and then it's a spy show, or a, um, I think it becomes a detective story with a love interest. And, you know, so that's even involved. And, and so this is sort of how Coover does that. Um, Lost in the Fun House, basically, you know, the fun house is the world, and it's a coming-of-age story. And a lot of times, metafiction has to do with picaresque stories of people, you know, coming of age or you know going from innocence to experience and you know that's where the satire is and um you know in the fun house it's you know that's a teenage boy and his family going to a kind of a coney island or atlantic city kind of place back east uh called ocean city um and it's you know a boardwalk and a carnival type atmosphere and he gets lost in the fun house literally and it's and it just becomes a horror story and but it's also, you know, a sort of a coming of age moment. And one of the things that Barth does is he he will not complete a sentence. He will interject himself into the story, saying, "Oh, you know, what am I, you know, going to do next?" And you know, I'm making this sound kind of bad, but these these stories are actually excellent examples of what was going on. And it's it's playing with real, you know, it's reacting to realism. Um, in a, you know, kind of like we've we've been there and done that with realism. So what are we going to do next? Well, let's play around with conventions and story techniques, and you know, interject the writer, you know, as a character. Um, David Foster Wallace does that in one of his stories where he puts himself in there. Um, you know, one of the one of the things Wallace says in this excellent essay on um, television and fiction writing is. Um, he says, for metafiction in its ascendant and most important phases was really nothing more than a single order expansion of its own great theoretical nemesis, realism. If realism called it like it saw it, metafiction simply called it as it saw itself, seeing itself, see it. This high cultural postmodern genre, in other words, was deeply informed by the emergence of television and the metastasis of self conscious watching. And I claim. American fiction remains deeply informed by television. And, you know, I probably will have more to say about that because I think that, you know, David Foster Wallace as a postmodern writer um, and an intellectual, um, you know, he's got his essays and he's got his novels and his short stories. And his novels were amazing examples of using postmodern technique. And, you know, he went through a a, a sort of trajectory where, you know, when he was younger, he was a full-blown postmodernist, but then he began to see that it was kind of bankrupt and time to move on and, and get serious with other things, you know, that like issues of spirit and ethics and morality and even love, you know, I, I think those things in Infinite Jest and The Pale King were were the things that made him something special. Um, and so I, I look to him for how to do postmodernism right, really. Um, but let me, you know, let me read an example, too, from, I, as long as I got it here, um, from Don DeLillo's novel. This will give you kind of an example of uh, what we're talking about here a little bit. Um, this, is, uh, this is from White Noise by Don DeLillo. Several days later, Murray asked me about a tourist attraction known as the most photographed barn in America. We drove 22 miles into the country around Farmington. 
There were meadows and apple orchards. White fences trailed through the rolling fields. Soon the signs started appearing. The most photographed barn in America. We counted five signs before we reached the site. We walked along a cow path to the slightly elevated spot set aside for viewing and photographing. All the people had cameras. Some had tripods, telephoto lenses, filter kits. A man in a booth sold postcards and slides, pictures of the barn taken from the elevated spot. We stood near a grove of trees and watched the photographers. Murray maintained a prolonged silence, occasionally scrawling some notes in a little book. No one sees the barn, he said finally. A long silence followed. Once you've seen the signs about the barn, it becomes impossible to see the barn. He fell silent once more. People with cameras left the elevated site, replaced it once by others. We're not here to capture an image. We're here to maintain one. Can you feel it, Jack? An accumulation of nameless energies. There was an extended silence. The man in the booth sold postcards and slides. Being here is a kind of spiritual surrender. We see only what the others see, the thousands who were here in the past, those who will come in the future. We've agreed to be part of the collective perception. This literally colors our vision, a religious experience in a way, like all tourism. Another silence ensued. They are taking pictures of taking pictures, he said. So, you know, that's that kind of shallowness and lack of depth I mean, you know, obviously DeLillo is satirizing that phenomena, but, but also, you know, there's writers writing like this as well. So, you know, this is an issue that is problematic. Um, I guess, you know, let me give you some movie examples too. You know, one of the things um, is that we, we don't just read I mean, a lot of people aren't reading literature at all, but uh, but most everybody's watching television and, and, and watching movies. So, you know, Groundhog Day is a great example of metafiction where the narrative is cyclical and repetitious with variations. Um, there's a movie called Stranger Than Fiction. I don't know if you're aware of that one, um, in which the main character is actually a fictional character who becomes conscious of the narrator and hears her as the story draws closer to his being killed off by by her, the author, and has to discern whether he is in a comedy or a tragedy. He goes to an English professor to find, you know, he first he goes to a psychologist who thinks he's schizophrenic. And finally, you know, he goes to an English professor who tries to diagnose which story he's in, you know, actually takes, this is Dustin Hoffman, takes him, you know, Will Ferrell is the main character, takes him seriously. Um, And then they try to figure out, okay, well, which kind of story are you in then, you know? And that's funny. Um, It's a great movie, actually. And then uh, Memento is another one. You know, the Tarantino films, Inglorious Bastards, Django Unchained, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where he rewrites historical events to kind of do revenge fantasies or, or to, you know, to change history the way he wants it to be. That would be very, you know, postmodern. Um, Arrival is a great science fiction contact movie where, you know, there are what look like flashbacks in the movie, but they actually turn out to be um, glimpses into the future, you know, so it's a non-linearity, you know, non-linearity is really big um, in postmodernism, and let me just jump to Wallace a little bit. Okay. Let me, there's a couple things he says that are just really key here, um, because, you know, he makes the case in this essay called um, E Unibus Plurum television and U.S. fiction that television is probably the the greatest promulgator of postmodernism in our culture we you know you you wouldn't even hardly think that you would think well this is coming out of academia or it's French you know literary critics or from the 60s you know who nobody reads right Um, I know I don't I let's look at what Wallace says he says If we want to know what American normality is, i.e. what Americans want to regard as normal, we can trust television. For television's whole raison is reflecting what people want to see. It's a mirror. The most dangerous thing for U.S. fiction writers is that we don't take it seriously enough 
as both a disseminator and a definer of the cultural atmosphere we breathe and process that many of us are so blinded by constant exposure. So, you know, he, his essay is 60 pages long, and it, it's very convincing. Um, mm-hmm. So, so that, that brings us up to, you know, the 50s and 60s. Um, I think postmodernism is becoming something else. Um, or, you know, I, I just don't know if we're, if we're on the cusp of moving towards something new. And, you know, this is, you know, 2020 is the new 60s and 70s, perhaps. You know, we're heading into the new. There's a revolution and, you know, kind of like the sexual revolution of the 60s. But in this case, it seems like the revolution now is, is urban cities versus rural um, populations. That's that's what it, you know, instead of the young versus the old, it's it's becoming something different. And so, you know, where we are in this pendulum swing from movement to movement, I do not know. My next question is about literature itself. Oh, yes. Okay. So um, what do you think the, or what is the purpose of literature? Um, and, of course, that question has probably been answered very diff- differently during different times. Um, so do you think there's any, I guess, what is the difference to how that question has been answered? Yeah. Um, and you've already gotten into how, how that would be answered in, in postmodernism. But, um, so, yeah, how would, that, how would that question be answered in the context of the Enlightenment or Romanticism right. um, or modernism? Well, so, so basically, if you jump forward to, you know, the Enlightenment, well, actually, probably in the Enlightenment, when rationality and a belief in God still existed, I would say that the purpose of literature was to instruct and to entertain. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, obviously, as a Veritas student, you and you, you know what paideia is, right? Mm-hmm. And and so, you know, part of the literature's job is enculturation and, you know, informing. Well, it, well it's an inter, you know, it's telling stories. Narrative and stories is, are how we make meaning out of life. And um, so, <laughs> in fact, uh, N.T. Wright's got a great, great little quote about, about this. Let me... Let me just quote him really quick. He says, I suggest that human writing is best conceived as the articulation of worldviews, or better still, the telling of stories which bring worldviews into articulation. Um, so, you know, why do, why, what is literature? Well, literature is a repository of all the greatest thoughts by the greatest thinkers and the best stories, and, you know, there's probably you know a handful of stories maybe maybe two you know less than 10 you know I don't know people debate how many stories there are 18 or 10 or or however many you know but you know the there are basic stories that we tell each other to you know it's entertainment and it's instruction or it's instruction or it's entertainment um and you know we we learn about life we learn about ethical moral issues we see life applied um, in experiential you know condensation so you know a novel would be something where you know it gives you the opportunity to kind of or poetry you can get into somebody else's mind and see the world through their eyes or see their see the world through the eyes of characters throughout history you know if someone writes about historical periods you know it gives you a glimpse into another culture another life um so that's what literature would ideally would be about well you know and in, in in the okay so that's started with the enlightenment looking at romanticism looking at modernism those things are cultural corrections so like a lot of the you know especially the beats you know they were they were critiquing culture or the metafictionists you know they were they were reacting to the previous era or the previous movement or the previous culture 
and and criticizing it and so that's another purpose of literature and you know obviously it's also to prophesy you know 1984 you know um we're brave new world those were kind of dystopian prophecies um for the purpose of correction and instruction and hey look out <laughs> mm-hmm. anyway yeah and a lot of those things are becoming more and more relevant um as we as we move forward right definitely so what are the what are the common themes of postmodern literature? You already mentioned a few, um, but just as a list, what do you what would you say they are? Well, so so right now, I mean, I kind of gave you a list earlier, which yeah. to some degree, you know, the metafictionists were and the Beats were sort of, you know, not necessarily naive, but were. But I mean, I look at them now, and I'm just like, you know, we've come a long way, mm-hmm. and and it's were you know so so basically what's happening you know and I say that having grown up in the 60s you know I was born in 61 so I uh, I went through that period Um, and now you know I'm 60 I'm seeing 2022 and I'm seeing revolution again Um, you know so unabashed social and political activism you know in a way that's not even art or literature anymore um you know the the anti-humanism um romanticism of the marginalized you know which manifests as white supremacy and you know critical race theory and you know um political correctness on steroids i mean i saw political correctness when i administrated a global online poetry board you know we workshop poetry and it was it was in the two, you know, 2000, 2010, it was nothing like it is now, um, you know, with cancel culture. Um, you know, there, there seems, you know, even among some of my friends, there seems to be zero interest in free speech, um, freedom of expression, discussion, argument, you know, hearing the other out, that isn't even of interest anymore. Um, you know, no one cares, wants to hear, you know, uh, arguments back and forth because they already know everything they already know better you know they they know what they think and what they believe and they're not interested in an alternative point of view so you know everything right now seems to be pointing towards non-hierarchical non-patriarchal um non-binary uh um non-linearity uh uncertainty pluralism multiculturalism you know the diversity, inclusion, um, equity platforms. Um, There seems to be a disconnection from history and and a a lack of interest in history, again, um, which is, to me, dangerous. Um, There's a, actually, you know, one of the things that's common is a multiplicity of voices that's wanted because of the tyranny of the main character. Um, So, like, you know, that's a, you know, collage and fragmentation is another one. Um, uh, less emphasis on the uh, artifact or artist. More interest in the text is something to to mess around with. You know, if you're a literary critic, you know, the death of the author, the death of the eye. Um, experience and process rather than, you know, the end result or refinement of an artifact or artifact as a trans- transcendent or exalted object that that was a modernist idea that's long over with so you know one of the things i do is i don't necessarily read a lot of postmodern literature but i do listen to a lot of interviews and podcasts and so that gives me insight into sort of what's going on in novels and fiction and poetry um you know there's a if you want to if you want to you know if you wanted to know what's going on in literature these days um you could listen to between the covers um this is a podcast that i really really like because david neiman is just such a great interviewer um but it's so unbelievable you know and he's he's a portland guy and and so to some degree you know he basically has a certain kind of guest right and um 
I don't, I mean, as a as my own poet type of person, I don't I don't have necessarily a grasp of the whole picture. But um, so so I'm not sure how how much these guests are representative of. You know, is it a is it a is this a minority? Is it a is it a majority? How how much does this represent the culture? I am really not sure, but but if it's representative of the culture, it's pretty scary. So so let me just kind of give you like a um, I'll just grab some people from random of interviews that I've been listening to on between the covers. Um, Jory Graham, you know, is a poet, very well respected, celebrated poet who whose last few cycles, you know, of books of poetry, um, I think the last four have to do with, um, you know, a planet in ecological collapse, a state of, you know, environmental collapse, apocalypse is a foregone conclusion, you know, we're just sort of, we, ha- you know, we haven't realized it yet, um, which, you know, I think is kind of jumping the gun. Also, you know, Ricky Ducournay's, um latest book of fiction um, called Traffic, you know, deals with the main character who's a transhuman. Um, it's just, She's not a science fiction writer per se, but the, her last book is sort of science fiction, you know, and um, this character, you know, the character who's transhuman is part machine, part human, and then um, there's the other characters in Android or AI who are, are traveling outside the silver solar system in a post-Earth scenario and mourning its loss like Adam and Eve, nostalgic for Eden. It's, you know, so so again, you know, the, the Earth's already dying and dead <laughs> in in these in this viewpoint. And um, another, you know, one of the things that uh, the next couple of people I'm going to mention, they have their own podcast. So, Patrick Otuma, um, has a podcast called Poetry Unbound, and again, I really admire his podcast, um, where he features a poem, and then he, you know, he explicates it. Um, he's a gay Irish poet, um, but so, for example, one thing that's interesting about him is, you know, he's a he's getting or he's either gotten a PhD in theology or he's getting one, and but he finds it less and less interesting to consider whether God truly exists and finding it more interesting to think of God as a great emptiness or silence, um, which, you know, I just, I'm, I don't understand, Mm -hmm. you know, how that, how you can love theology and study it and, and then not necessarily, uh, have any substantive faith, um, that God actually exists. It's kind of mind blowing. Um, Another one would be Rachel Zucker, who, you know, her, her podcast is Commonplace. Um, she's a poet who hosts um, a podcast and, and, and I th- with whose aim, I think, is that she wants it to be a platform to be openly hostile towards heteropatriarchy and white supremacy and capitalism. And um, she carefully interrogates guests beforehand to find out if they offer any whiffs of conservatism and, mm-hmm. you know, so that she can run not walk from that kind of discussion so you know another one would be Max Porter Um, he's a novelist in the UK who um, his main character he he actually intentionally does not develop um, just so that he can invite reader participation and imaginative engagement you know he doesn't want to tyrannize the narrative you know with the with him imposing as an author, you know, what the character should be. And mm-hmm. uh, and he's, you know, anti-hierarchy and anti-canonical and anti-Western. And, you know, he's he says he's not religious, but he's drawn to Druidism. And, you know, he's, he speaks lov- lovingly and worshipfully about a tree. So, mm-hmm. um, again, you know, th- these are... These are writers that are, I think, re- I don't know how celebrated. I mean, I think that they're, they are successful authors. You know, one of the things that's happened, um, ob- you know, obviously there was TV and when Wallace 
David Foster Wallace was writing, and he was looking at TV primarily as the main promulgator. Well, well, now you know, we have the internet, we have our phones, we have basically um, perception and reality, and are being mediated by a screen. Um, and you know, one of the benefits would be that publishing is has broken wide open. So you know, whether you're dealing with music or you're streaming movies or you're, um, you know, talking about publishing of poetry or fiction. Um, there is no longer a gate that has limited that. Um, now it's just wide open. There, there's publishing being done everywhere and it's online and it's, you know, so that, that revolution is also going on, which is changing how we how we uh, consume culture, mm -hmm. and it's radical. I mean, we're in the midst of it, and it's going very fast, and, you know. So, at any rate, those are those are some things that were, you know, I just figured I'd throw out there. Mm -hmm. um, how much of literature is affected by politics th um, that, that you, that you well. see from these, from these examples or... Well, so, so a lot of what I notice about literature is that it's so ideologically driven, mm -hmm. um, which I, th I find alarming um, because it's no longer attempting to be art. You know, even when, when Steinbeck was writing Grapes of Wrath, you know, that, that's a marred masterpiece in my opinion because it's, you know, there's, there's actually, you know, inaccuracies in historically and some of the history of it and I, I mean you know he had a he had an agenda and you know he's interspersing little essays in between the narrative you know to further this agenda of social justice which which is fine you know grapes of wrath is a is a great book there's no denying it but i think it's marred um because of the ideological stance that's being imported into the into the art you know rather than it just being infused or you know part of the narrative it's it's being imposed and you can you know as a reader you can tell the difference and so one of the things that I, I I notice in especially you know these interviews that I'm hearing is that these fictional works are they carry a progressive agenda you know it's assumed that this is the enlightened correct position and that everybody should agree with it and um you know, it's ignoring the other side. So, for example, you know, with, with Max Porter that I mentioned earlier, you know, he makes it really clear that he hates Brexit supporters. Um, he just, he has contempt for them. And, you know, that just obviously means that he doesn't have a full picture of what's, of his, of his country. Um, mm -hmm. If he's just sort of like, you know, we see this a lot, and even the U.S., you yeah. know, obviously, you know, half of the population thinks one way, half the population thinks the other way, and, and some of this just seems to be a temperamental personality issue and how we perceive reality. You know, most of the question of this, of what we're talking about, has to do with epistemology, um, how do we know what we know, you know, our perception of reality, um, is there an objective reality? Is it empirically discerned? Is it, is it, um, you know, having to do with our temperament? You know, we're high in openness, low in conscientious conscientiousness. Is it, does it have to do with our, um, uh, our presuppositions? Our, you know, political presuppositions, our religious presuppositions. You know, I think that religion and spiritual viewpoints precede politics probably you know I don't know if politics would precede culture I think I think culture what you're what you th believe um, spiritually will will determine to some degree your political viewpoint not necessarily because obviously they're progressive and conservative Christians but but to some degree that that's going to play a role um, you know how do we you know and then obviously our news is being filtered you know or if we're if we're relying on the screen to tell us 
what to think and what to believe, then we're we're receiving something. You know, where we're you know, we are not coming up with our own conclusions. We're just sort of taking in. Um, one of the okay, so one of the big factors is social construction um, being the determiner of reality. Um, this is a big postmodern belief, right? Everything is socially constructed, you know, and of, oftentimes it's about power. Um, who's who's they're the ones that are constructing reality for us, so, you know. And then is gender socially constructed? You know, we're not even going to pay attention to science. We're going to discount science because um, even though you know we're biologically constructed, we're going to pretend like it's social construction. And if you don't like how you were biologically constructed you can just have op an operation and get it changed you know to match whatever you you think you should be so that's how far we've come mm -hmm. um, and literature is going to reflect that just like any other artifact of culture you know whether it's art or music or literature um. yeah um, so a lot of what we've talked about has been I don't know, has been we found alarming and all these things, but what, um, is there any good uh, to have come out of this? Do you think there are any positive, uh, I don't know, positive things that we could take from the, from, from postmodernism? I think there are lots of positives. Um, you know, some of it is a two-edged sword, like, okay, so for example, I think that Amazon and Google and Apple products are positives. You know, it's it's sort of like uh, they have opened up, you know, so Amazon, you can get any book you could possibly want. Um, you can have just about anything shipped to your door. Um, Google opens up information to you you know that at the touch of a phone you know um, you know and then of course you know Apple has Apple and Microsoft have given us computers um, and phones um, so those are those can either be good or bad depending on how you view that um, they can be used for good or bad um, one of the things that has happened with through I mean you know I guess I should mention Ian McGilchrist. Uh, he wrote a fascinating book um, that touches on all of this. Um, he's a neuroscientist, and half of his book talks about, you know, the brain hemispheres and how they operate, and you know, in a dual computational way, you know. Um, and uh, um, the other half of his book has to do with looking at cultural movements and how we pendulum swing back and forth you know from sort of a a right brain to left brain sort of way you know modernism would probably be left brain romanticism would be right brain you know postmodernism would be right brain I think we're, we're due for a shift to the left brain again you know if that's I mean this is really grossly <laughs> um paraphrasing that book but but it's a fascinating book I would highly recommend it um, it's it's called the master and his emissary and so so basically you know we I, I think that even though wh one of the things that postmodernism does is it complicates things we we can't you know we can't be naive about how we perceive reality anymore we can't because perception you know you you don't you don't just look out and see objective reality out there you know through your senses um, we are in some to some degree constructing reality there's no question about it um, you know you can't come to the Bible and you know in a pre critical stance and just read it and and think that you can you know without any historical or cultural context um, you know as the medievals did you know um, now we've one of the one of the benefits is the more you dig and the you know the deeper you go you find out m that there's more complexity you know when you go into the human body and you you know you look at you, you you know you go into electron microscope 
levels of, you know, you would expect that things would become simpler, right? But they don't. They get more complex. And so, you know, to some degree, our understanding of reality and our understanding of God's world becomes all the more complex the, the harder we look at it and the more critically we look at it. And so, you know, one of the advantages to something like this <clears throat> is that we come out more knowledgeable um, and naivete is done away with. Um, and so, you know, I would say that there's been a lot of good things that have, you know, modernism was a problem and, and it needed to be reacted against. I mean, I think that one of the things that's really interesting is why we can't just sort of, why do we have to flip flop and pendulum swing between two extremes? Why can't we just go right down the middle? But that just doesn't seem possible. And I think part of it is because we're, we're in the middle of a spiritual war, but, but ultimately we are headed towards um, Isaiah 60, which would be the city of God, you know, and I, I do think that we're, you know, we're moving in the right direction. Um, you know, no, no era has been trouble free or, you know, every era has seemed dark at the time, but, you know, basically, um, there are other things that are, that are really good. I think publishing, not being sort of five publishers in the East Coast, you know, New York, Boston, wherever they, you know, that Northeast stronghold has been, been decentralized by the internet and, um, just the publishing is more, more poetry is being published than ever before in the history of the world. I'm pretty sure, um, there are just hundreds of books being published every year, if not thousands, um, you know, moving from strictly metered verse to free verse. And, you know, so, so I'm a, I'm a bit of a postmodernist, you know, a book I'm working on, a manuscript I'm working on is a book of prose poetry, um, about my landfill experiences. Um, and I have a multiplicity of, you know, characters and voices, you know, so I, here I am writing prose poetry I'm you know, have, I'm featuring all these voices in my book. Uh, so I'm a postmodern, you know, one of the things that probably important to say is we are all postmoderns. We we're you know, uh, we're in the middle of it. Um, kind of, I don't know if you're familiar with David Foster Wallace's commencement speech to Kenyon college, um, where he says, this is water. You know, he tells a little joke about two young fish that meet an old fish and the old fish says to him, uh, how's the water boys, you know, and, and they say what's water you know and so we are we are in the middle of postmodernism and and you don't necessarily have to be a postmodernist but we are all postmoderns and and so you know we're going to you know there's there's just so much more sophistication in literature and enrichment despite all the the dead ends that are taken um uh one of the things that I find kind of interesting is there's a couple people that um, like George Saunders came out with a book um, he's a fiction writer um, but he teaches a master class in uh, at Syracuse and you know like 600 people apply to this he picks five or something or whatever and, and he focuses on 19th century Russian writers and to teach his fiction course and then he and he just came out with a book which he outlined some of those stories and his syllabus and his, his teaching and uh you know it's called a swim in a pond in the rain that's amazing um you know there's a poet named ross gay uh he's come out with a couple of books one one book of poetry called the catalog of unabashed gratitude and and an s book of essays called book of delights these are positive things that are there's 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 positive things happening within literature because it's so immense um, and everybody's off doing their own thing. So although we we know that some of these extreme things are going on, there's there's other things that are you know you can find your niche somewhere. So that would be a few of them. Uh, so another question is uh, how should we as Christians react? Ah, yes. Well, 
I think that we're we're called to um, use our gifts, whatever gifts we've been given, you know, our unique place in the body of Christ to reach the world um, in any way that we can. And if, you know, whatever it is that you, we are called to do, um, one of the things that I find distinctly missing in, um, you know, some of, some of the, the problems with postmodern writers that I was outlining is they just, they're so critical, they're so negative, um, you know, you, you feel like you've been beaten up and, and, you know, that the, the world is without forgiveness or hope, um, after you've read them. And so what's missing is, is warmth, humor, gratitude, love, real tolerance, forgiveness, um, the loss, there's a loss of connection and unity. So, you know, we're all human. Um, we are all made in the image of God. Just reminding people of that would be in, in whatever vocation you have, whatever your calling is, um, wherever your gifts will lead you, you know, to your community. Um, I would say that's how we're to respond. You know, we're, you know, we are bringing the kingdom of God to earth. That's our, our goal or our mission, you know, to physically bring the spiritual reality to bear. Um, if I'm writing a book of poetry, you know, you would, you would hope that it would be an enlightening force for good. Um, rather than just succumbing to the culture, you know, we, we're, we're all actually should be countercultural. So reminding yourself of that, um, I would say being steeped in scripture and trying to maintain a biblical frame amidst our sort of wacky, um, wayward culture is, is, you know that you're gonna have plenty of opportunities to be countercultural if you can do that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's one of the things I talked about with uh, Joseph Clare. Um, the church has to be in the world, but not of the world. Right. Um, and so, and that was another thing that I talked about with uh, Mr. Lynch about education. We have to teach people, teach kids how to be in the world, but not of the world, not succumb to the ways of the world. So that's it's a very, very important thing to know and understand and try to do. Let me uh, let me read a little excerpt. So there's a there's a book by um, J.D. Salinger that I, I really like. It's called Franny and, and Zoe. Um, and it's just such a surprise that Salinger, you know, who is Jewish and he's, he's writing about this Jewish family, you know, that this character would come up in his writing and. I don't even know what to make of it. Um, you know, Franny is, is it, you know, in this family the um, that's featured in, in a lot of these stories. Um, and she is, is having a nervous breakdown of sorts. Um, and, and she's, um, she's, on this uh, trip with her boyfriend, or actually they, they go to a restaurant, I mean, they're meeting each other after not having seen each other for a while, and they meet in a restaurant, and they're having lunch, and, you know, he's on another wavelength, and she's, she's reading a book called um, Way of the Pilgrim, which is a Russian um, mystic, you know, who wrote this book in the Middle Ages, um, and it's orthodox mysticism, you know, which is a classic, actually. And so she's, you know, turning, you know, I think she's saying the Jesus prayer, you know, it, which is just so atypical of this time period. And, and so I just thought I'd read this little excerpt. It's really kind of interesting. Um, uh, and I'm just jumping in the middle here. And they're having a dialogue at lunch. Um, you've got two of the best men in the country in your goddamn English department. Manlius Esposito. God, I wish I had them here. At least they're poets, for Christ's sake. This is her boyfriend talking. They're not, Franny said. 
that's partly what's so awful. I mean, they're not real poets. They're just people that write poems that get published and anthologized all over the place. But they're not poets. She stopped self-consciously and put out her cigarette. For several minutes now, she had seemed to be losing color in her face. Suddenly, even her lipstick seemed a shade or two lighter, as though she had just blotted it with a leaf of Kleenex. Let's not talk about it, she said, almost listlessly, squashing her cigarette stub in the ashtray. I'm way off. I'll just ruin the whole weekend. Maybe there's a trap door under my chair, and I'll just disappear. The waiter came forward very briefly and left a second martini in front of each of them. Lane put his fingers, which were slender and long, and usually not far out of sight, around the stem of his glass. You're not ruining anything, he said quietly. I'm just interested in finding out what the hell goes. I mean, do you have to be a goddamn bohemian type or dead, for Christ's sake, to be a real poet? What do you want, some bastard with wavy hair? No. Can't we let it go? Please. I'm feeling absolutely lousy and I'm getting a terrible... I'd be very happy to drop the whole subject. I'd be delighted. Just tell me first what a real poet is, if you don't mind. I'd appreciate it. I really would. There was a faint glisten of perspiration high on Franny's forehead. It might only have meant that the room was too warm, or that her stomach was upset, or that martinis were too potent. In any case, Lane didn't seem to notice it. I don't know what a real poet is. I wish you'd stop it, Lane. I'm serious. I'm feeling very peculiar and funny, and I can't... All right, all right, okay, relax, Lane said. I was only trying... I know this much is all, Franny said. If you're a poet, you do something beautiful. I mean, you're supposed to leave something beautiful after you get off the page and everything. The ones you're talking about don't leave a single solitary thing beautiful. All that maybe the slightly better ones do is sort of get inside your head and leave something there. But just because they do, just because they know how to leave something, doesn't It doesn't have to be a poem, for heaven's sake. It may just be some kind of terribly fascinating syntaxy droppings. Excuse the expression. Like Manlius and Esposito, all those poor men. Lane took time to light a cigarette for himself before he said anything. Then, I thought you liked Manlius. As a matter of fact, about a month ago, if I remember correctly, you said he was darling and that you... I do like him. I'm sick of just liking people. I wish to God I could meet somebody I could respect. Would you excuse me for just a minute? Franny was suddenly on her feet with her handbag in her hand. She was very pale. So, you know, I'm convicted by that because, you know, what Franny wants is beautiful poetry, um, something with beauty in it. And I can't necessarily say that I always pull that up. You know, I tend to be critical. Um, just like the rest of my culture, you know, am I writing about beauty and am I, you know, writing love poems? No, not really. So, so, you know, that text from Franny and Zoe actually convicts and inspires me. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and and this is written by J.D. Salinger, who, as far as I know, wasn't a believer, but maybe he was, I don't know. Mm -hmm. He's, he's certainly got some wisdom there. So, right. Coming from somewhere. You know, one other thing too, Tristan, that I think would be helpful is to, so so N.T. Wright has this uh, this book called The New Testament and the People of God, and and in the very first part of this book, which is you know he's got a series of five books on theology, his magnum opus, you know these five books. Actually, I think the last the fifth book turned into two books, so it's actually six, but. He has a, he has a, um, I think uh, this is important. He has a way of how to read literature. It's called critical realism. And he, he takes about 75, 200 pages to outline how he's going to go about reading, you know, the Bible, which could be broken into three things, basically literature, theology, and history. And he, and he sort of outlines a hermeneutic of love as he calls it, but ultimately he's talking about this way of reading, which is critical realism. Um, I think this would be a solution to our problem as readers, um, how we should approach any text, but especially the Bible. Um, 
So here it goes. It's a little bit long. In love, at least in the idea of agape, as we find it in some parts of the New Testament, the lover affirms the reality and the otherness of the beloved. Love does not seek to collapse the beloved into terms of itself, and even though it may speak of losing itself in the beloved, such a loss always turns out to be a true finding. In the the familiar paradox, one becomes fully oneself when losing oneself to another. In the fact of love, in short, both parties are simultaneously affirmed. When applied to reading text, this means that the text can be listened to on its own terms without being reduced to the scale of what the reader can or cannot understand at the moment. It is puzzling. If it is puzzling, the good reader will pay it the compliment of struggling to understand it, of living with it, and continuing to listen. But however close the reader gets to understanding the text, the reading will still be peculiarly that reader's reading. The subjective is never lost, nor is it necessary or desirable that it should be. At this level, love will mean attention, the readiness to let the other be the other, the willingness to grow and change in oneself in relation to the other. When we apply this principle to the three stages of the reading process, the relation of readers to texts, of texts to their authors, and beyond that to the realities they purport to describe, it will be possible to make a number of simultaneous affirmations. First, we can affirm both that the text does have a particular viewpoint from which everything is seen, and at the same time that the reader's reading is not mere neutral observation. Second, we can affirm both that the text has a certain life of its own and that the author had intentions of which we can, in principle, gain at least some knowledge. Third, we can affirm both that the actions or objects described may well be, in principle, actions and objects in the public world, and that the author was looking at them from a particular and perhaps dis distorting point of view. At each level, we need to say both and, not just either or. Each stage of this process becomes a conversation in which misunderstanding is likely, perhaps even inevitable, but in which, through patient listening, Real understanding and real access to external reality is actually possible and attainable. What I am advocating is critical realism, though I would prefer to describe it as an epistemology or hermeneutic of love, as the only sort of theory which will do justice to the complex nature of texts in general, of history in general, and of the Gospels in particular. Armed with this, we will be able to face the questions and challenges of reading the New Testament with some hope of making sense of it all. So if we could read like that, hmm. you know, that <laughs> we, we would, uh, you know, we wouldn't pretend that language, I mean, you know, it's just an openness to possibility and truth and um, having another speak to us. And, you know, rather than playing games with a text, um, which is sort of what's going on now, you know, either someone's trying to manipulate us you know, and force a ideology or an agenda on us or, you know, filter what information we receive or, you know, tell us that, you know, you can't just read a text straightforwardly, um, you know, that there's power play involved, um, we're being manipulated, all of this stuff. So, you know, basically, I think Wright is just advocating an openness to the text and what it might be saying and, you know, and be being willing to let your understanding change over time especially when you're coming to a sacred text mm -hmm. that's complicated i i appreciate your indulging me <laughs> reading reading all these texts um i thought it would be fun to close with this poem that you know that to bookend the talk with this other hell poem um because i think that it you know herbert was was outlining you know artists in hell for one reason um I think to some degree, you know, as, as humans on earth, the closest we will ever come to heaven or hell is what we experience here on earth. And so, you know, this last poem points out some of our, some of our problems <laughs> on earth as we, as we might be on a trajectory towards hell. So, so this, this poem is by a California poet, you know, I don't know if he's still alive. He may be, but he's—he was 
writing relatively recently from L.A., um, and it's called Hell. I died and went to hell, and it was nothing like L.A. The air all shimmering and blue. No windows busted. Gutted walk-ups, muggings, rapes. No drooling hoodlums hulking in the doorways. Hell isn't anything like Ethiopia or Bangladesh or Bogota. Beggars are unheard of. No one's starving. Nobody lies moaning in the streets. Nor is it Dachau with its ovens. Troy in flames. Some slaughterhouse where squealing animals hung upside down are bled and skinned. Quite the contrary. In hell, everybody's health is fine. Forever. And the weather is superb. Eternal spring. The countryside all wildflowers, and the cities hum with commerce. Cargo ships bring all the latest in appliances, home entertainment, foreign culture, silks. Folks fall in love, have children. There is sex and romance for the asking. In a word, the place is perfect. Only unlike heaven, where when it rains, the people are content to let it rain. In hell, they live like we do, endlessly complaining. Nothing is, nothing as it is, is ever right. The astroturf, a nuisance. Neighbors, kids, too noisy. Traffic, nothing but a headache. If the patio were just a little larger, or the sunroof on the Winnebago worked. If only we had darker eyes, or softer skin, or longer legs, lived elsewhere, plied a different trade, were slender, sexy, wealthy, younger, famous, loved, athletic, Friend, I swear to you, as one who has returned, if only to bear witness, no satanic furies beat their kited wings, no bats shriek overhead, there are no flames, no vats of boiling oil, wait to greet us in that doleful kingdom, nothing of the sort. The gentleman who will ferry you across is all solicitude and courtesy, the river black but calm, the crossing less eventful than one might have guessed, though no doubt you will think it's far too windy on the water, that the glare is awful, that you're tired, hungry, ill at ease, or that if nothing else the quiet is unnerving, that you need a drink, a cigarette, a cup of coffee. All right. <laughs> That's our problem, Tristan. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Unless there's anything else. No, All thank right. you. I, I really appreciate you having me on. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you for your time. Yeah.